This presentation is for AMS filing only. We shall begin with the login screen. Log in with your SCAT code, username, and password. Starting with the tables menu, we'll go to locations. To set up a location, select your country from the drop-down selection. Enter your port city name. For foreign locations, check the box next to is foreign port and select your port name again from the drop-down selection. When you select it, the customs code automatically pulls in. Make sure it's flagged as a marine location and save. For AMS filings, all that is required is what you see on the screen. If you're setting up a U.S. port location, just don't check the box for foreign ports and all the ports in the drop-down selection will be U.S. ports. To search for a location, click Find and type in your port location name. If it's already saved in the database, it will pull up on the screen select it, and the information is displayed. All databases will come preloaded with ports already entered for foreign and domestic, but in some cases you may have to add additional ports. You can also add inland locations, which may or may not require a customs code. From here, we'll go to the vessel setup. Again, databases can be preloaded with vessels. You may still have to add vessels, or you may want to add your own vessels without having the database preloaded. Just simply type in your vessel name, and to search for vessels that may already be in the database, click on Find and type in your vessel name. Select it, and the information will display if it's already created. If you need to add it, just type in the vessel name. You have a drop-down selection for vessel type. Enter the owner's name or the vessel operator's name. If you're not sure what to enter there, you can leave it blank. It's not a mandatory field. Enter the Lloyd's code which has to be at least seven digits. You have a drop-down for country flag and enter the U.S. SCAT code of the vessel operator. So this would be the SCAT code for this company. Example, also, if it's a Haypeg Lloyd vessel, you would enter Haypeg Lloyd SCAT code. What you see on the screen is all that is required when filing AMS. We also give the option that you can uncheck the box next to the vessel name for send into customs. In some cases, you may get an error on your manifest transmission from customs that reads no bills processed for port or invalid conveyance name. And this is usually because your vessel name that you've set up does not match exactly the way Customs has it in their system. You may try to set up a vessel name that may be abbreviated where Customs doesn't have it abbreviated or vice versa. Um, you also may use spaces or dash marks where Customs would not or vice versa. Any of these could cause your manifest to not be accepted. So again, you always have the option to off-check, send in the vessel name, but always make sure you transmit the Lloyd's code. Next, we'll go to SCAT code, and this is where you create your database for all of the carriers you do business with. 
These are the vessel operators and also the master carriers that issue the master bills of lading. Just type in the company name and their USA SCAT code. You do not have to enter carrier code for AMS violence. To search for SCACs that are already in your database, click Find, and you can search either by SCAT code or by company name. Hit Search, and if it already exists in the database, click on it, Information pulls in. Again, the carrier code is not required for AMS violence. That field may be left blank. You want to be sure that you do set up all of the SCAT codes for the various carriers you do business with. Information is entered in the fields. Always make sure you save the screen. Next is Security Manager. Security Manager is for setting up additional users for the system. You can just type in the information. I'll pull up an example here. You enter the username if you're doing a search. For setting up users, again, just enter the person's name. Phone and fax number can be left blank. Always check the box next to active to indicate they are an active user. Administrator is the person who would be responsible for setting up additional users in the database. They will have access to the security manager menu under tables. When setting up normal users, these users will not have access to the security manager. So there should be one administrator per office or per location. Assign a username and password. Reconfirm the password. And you may or may not enter their email address. Below you check the boxes for all of the menus that you want the users to have access to. For file and AMS, the boxes here are already checked. IT selection, if you want to file your ITs electronically, you have to have a Type 2 custodial bot. And you can also file ITs as well as TNEs and IEs electronically through the system. If you don't have that use for that menu, you can uncheck the box. Arrival notice reports, again, these are also for users that have to pay an additional expense for that feature. Some of these do require additional charges, such as the bill charge screen which is also used primarily with the arrival notice report screen. These would be for an additional charge. Permit to transfer, again, for NBOs who have consolidated containers, they may also be able to transmit electronically to customs their permit to transfer or PTT, which allows them to move consolidated boxes off the terminal to a bonded facility where the container would be stripped. Or in the case of export, um, you may stuff containers off the terminal and then have them delivered. But this would be strictly for the import box coming off the terminal to be stripped at a bonded facility. Customs Manifest Report allows you to be able to look at a hard copy of the manifest. Creating a subordinate SCAC, we'll go through that next. All of these fields, again, would be strictly for AMS. Vessel arrival and vessel departure. These menus are only for the master carrier who files AMS. 
Master carriers are responsible to depart vessels from the last foreign port to U.S. Customs, as well as arrive in the vessels at the U.S. ports, the vessel calls in the U.S. So again, the master carrier and not the NVO would need access to these menus. If you're also filing ISF, then you want to check the box for I add ISF. Um, in the case that you're not filing ISF, don't check it. For this demonstration, we're just going to be doing AMS only. Once you have the appropriate boxes checked for the users, save the information. Again, if you need to go back to look up a user that's already been created, just click Find, type in the user name, which is their user ID, to search for that information to be pulled up on the screen. Next, we have subordinate SCAC. This screen allows the user to transmit to customs an AMS or an ISF under a SCAC code other than their own. So if a customer who has a SCAC code were to contact you and ask if you could transmit on their behalf an AMS or ISF, you would simply come to this screen, type in that other customer's SCAT code, enter their bond number, select the type of company that has contacted you, whether it's an importer, broker, uh, another NVO, international carrier, and the type of bond they have, continuous or single transaction. V number is not required. Again, this is only if they are using the um, IT selection screen for transmitting electronically ITs, TNEs, or IEs. Customs will issue a V number to all those users that have the Type 2 custodial bond. Enter here the name of the customer that the SCAT code above belongs to. If the customer contacting you does not have a bond, you can check the box that reads is same as main SCAC. You can still transmit an AMS or ISF under a different SCAT code, but in this case, the information would go under your bond and not the customer's bond. From here we'll go to customer profile screen and this is where you can set up all of your repeat customers, shippers, consignees, notify parties and such. Just type in the customer's information on the screen. To find a customer that may already be in the database Click Find. Type in the customer's name. You only have to enter minimum of four characters to do searches on any screen. Click Search. If the information is already stored in your database, you'll see it appear. Click on it to select and the information will display. Again, if you're adding information, you just click New to refresh the screen. Simply type in the customer's name. You have two lines to enter their address. Each line cannot exceed 35 characters in length. Enter the city in the city field. You have drop-down selection for country and also for state if applicable. Enter the zip code. Phone and fax number are not required for customs. Once you've set up the information on the screen, save. The screen will always ask, do you want the entity identifier? The entity identifier is a number 
for the consignee or importer of goods that is only required when transmitting ISFs to customs. It can be an employer ID number or IRS number, social security number, passport number, etc. For AMS only filings, this number is not required, so you always want to say no. This will allow you to save the screen without having to validate this field. Click OK and your customer information is saved in the database. When you're ready to transmit your first vessel after your tables have been set up, first thing is to go to the Voyage menu and Voyage Schedule. And here you will create the Voyage Schedule for the vessel you're going to transmit. Select your vessel from the drop-down. The SCAT code for the vessel operator automatically pulls in and you just need to type in your voyage number. For AMS purposes, the voyage number cannot exceed five characters. The next three fields, crew members, passengers, report number, are all left blank. These are not required for AMS filings. To start entering your ports, you're going to begin with your load port. Click New. And you're only having to enter the ports that you are reporting cargo from to the U.S. So enter your first load port. Again, you don't have to enter the entire port name as long as it's minimum four characters. You can either hit your tab key or click on the binocular icon to select the location. Terminal name is not required. For your arrival date, click on the field and you'll see an icon for a calendar. Click on it and select the date that the vessel is due to arrive at the load port. Click Done, and then do the same for your sale date. Flag it as a load port. If you have additional load ports, just click New and Continue. When you've entered your last load port that you'll be reporting, make sure you flag it as the last load port. Then you can enter your discharge ports. Again, click New and type in your discharge port. Now you're going to enter the arrival date at the port of discharge and your sale date. Now flag it as a discharge. And again, if you have more than one discharge port, just click New and keep adding. Once you've finished your schedule, click Save. Information is saved. Now you're ready to create your bills of lading. So you'll go to the bill of lading menu, bill header. This screen is set up for NVOs who transmit AMS. They are considered NVO type automated NVOs. The only difference between an NVO and a non-NVO, which would be the master carrier, is that the master carrier would not have the additional two fields where the master bill of lading goes. But for the NVO, they have to report the master bill number that they are issued against their house bill of lading. So for NBOs, you will enter your house bill of lading number minus your SCAT code in this field. If you're a master carrier, you just enter your regular bill of lading number in this field. When you save the screen, your SCAT code for your bill of lading will automatically appear under the house bill of lading SCAC field. 
and that's the same for a master carrier as well. So you don't have to actually enter your SCAC in this field. I'm going to pull up a bill of lading for demonstration and also if you need to find a bill that has already been entered in the system you just go to find, click on it, and type in your bill of lading number. Hit search and then select your bill of lading. So this is the way a bill of lading would look as completed by an NVO. House bill number, house bill of lading SCAC, which will appear again once you save the bill screen. Status reads complete, leave it at complete, leave the NVO type as is, leave bill type as way bill. Under SCAC bill for the NVO, they will enter the SCAC code for the master carrier that issues their master bill of lading and then the master bill number. Come down to the shipper name and address. And for here, again, you only have to type in up to four characters of the shipper's name. Click on your binocular icon. And if you already saved it under your press customer profile screen previously, it will display, select it, and it pulls in. Works the same for the consignee and notify as well. If you forgot to save the customer's name and address in the customer profile screen prior to creating the bill, all you have to do is click on this paper icon and you can enter the customer details on this screen. Save it and then the information will be stored in your database for future as well as automatically pulling into the screen. Come down next to the vessel schedule and this is where you're going to enter the vessel name that you want to report. Enter the vessel name but don't enter the voyage number. Either hit your tab key or your binocular icon and select from the drop down menu the voyage number that you want to report to customs. When you do, the SCAT code for the vessel operator automatically pulls in as an also notify party. If the SCAT code for the also notify differs from the SCAT code of the carrier that issued the master bill. You must enter that SCAT code for the master bill under also notify parties. And to do that, you just click add row. And in the second field under carrier name, you can enter either the company name or the SCAT code. Hit your tab key and select it from the tables menu. So now the carrier that issued your master bill is also shown as an also notify party. It's very important that the carrier that issues the master bill is shown as an also notify. If they are also the vessel operator, then you don't have to list them twice but failing to enter the SCAT code of the vessel carrier that issues the master bill would mean that the carrier issuing the master bill may not know your house bill is on file with customs and therefore may not load your container. After you've entered your vessel information, here you'll have your place of receipt. If you have an actual place of receipt, you enter it here. If you don't have an actual place of receipt, you can leave it blank. Your port of load and port of discharge 
you'll have drop down selections and this is be the same ports that you set up in your voyage schedule. So just click to select the ports you want to report. Place of delivery, if you have an actual place of delivery, enter it. If not, you can leave it blank. In the case of a transshipment, when you set up your voyage schedule, you're only reporting the vessel that actually calls the U.S. Therefore, the transshipment port would become your load port. And your origin load port would be list, listed as your place of receipt. When entering place of receipt or place of delivery, these ports need to also be set up in your location tables. Again, if a port code does not apply, um, some inlands have port codes and some do not. But for these, you would set them up as inlands rather than marine locations. Type in the name and hit your binocular icon to select it from the tables. For move type, you have a selection to choose from. For carriers that are reporting break bulk or bulk cargo, they would make the first selection. For containerized cargo, you may select any of the following. Country of origin and Canada Customs Office are not required when filing AMS only. Under equipment, you just click add row. It opens up the fields and you're going to enter your first container number. You have a drop down selection to select your size type container. Click add row to add the seal number for that container. For any additional containers, you click add row. Enter your next container, select size type, and click add row to add the seal number for the next container. And you may continue on for however many containers you want to report. Come down to packages. You always start with item number one. When you hit your tab key, your container number that was reported under equipment the first container number will automatically pull in. Marks and numbers will default to read no marks. You can leave it at no marks or you can edit to add actual marks. Type in your piece count and you have a drop down selection for package type. Type in your weights. For US Customs you can report Imperial or metric. For carriers reporting bulk cargo, they also can report kilograms or metric tons. Measurements, again, you can report imperial or metric. Uh, for U.S. Customs, measurements are not required for AMS. Only the weights are required. If you have additional containers, again, click Add Row. Next one would be item number two. Tab over. It will pull in the second container that you've entered under equipment above. And so on and so forth. Item three, item four, etc. Go down to Cargo, and again, we start with the first item number. Again, tab over. Your container number will automatically pull in, and you simply type in your cargo description. If you're only following AMS, this is all the information that is required. Other fields would be required if you're reporting the ISF. Once you've finished, scroll back to the top of the screen, and you're going to hit Save. Information has been saved, click OK. If any of the data that's required were left blank, 
when you save the bill, it would alert you at that time. So example, I'll remove the cargo section and now go back and save the bill header. Now it's telling me the bill is not valid for AMS transmission. Do you want to save it? Yes, I want to save it because I don't want to lose the data I've already entered. So I'm going to click OK. However, it's going to give me a red flag to indicate I have an AMS error. To know what the error is, I click on it and it will display your error message. So I can see my cargo entry is not available. I need to go back and add it. I go back to cargo, click add row, item 1, tab over, my container pulls in, tab over, and I'm going to type in my cargo description. Go back to the top of the bill header, click save. Information has been saved. I click OK and now the AMS error message has disappeared. When you're ready to create your second bill, you can click New to refresh the screen. You also have a copy function. So if you have more than one house bill against the same master bill, or if you have the same customer information for a different container, you can just click copy and everything will copy over except for the bill of lading number. So you can add the next bill number and then edit any of the fields on the bill header required for the next bill, save it, and you've created your second bill. You can also, if you choose to go back to a previous bill, to do a copy. Again, just click Find, enter the bill number to do a search, and you can copy that bill over. Once you've set up all of your bills of lading, you're ready to transmit. You want to go to AMS, Add Original Manifest. Here, select your vessel and your voyage number that you want to transmit. If you have more than one load or discharge port, you can select the ports you want to transmit, or you can just click Find, and any ports you have entered bills of lading against will display. Select the port pair you want to transmit, put a check mark in the box under Original Manifest, and click Save. This action will transmit your manifest to Customs. To check that your manifest is on file and whether or not you have Customs errors, go back to AMS and now AMS Main Screen. Again, select your vessel voyage and the ports that you want to search. This line will display the port pairs you transmitted. ETA will be the ETA at the port of discharge. The number of bills for that port pair that were transmitted. The date and time you sent the information. This would be the user's ID, the person that logged into the system to transmit the information. This column would indicate whether or not you have customs errors. When the information has been processed and transmitted, these two columns will change from an N to a Y. This is date and time information goes into a Q, and then once the information has processed and transmitted, you'll get an active date and time. This is when the information leaves our system and goes to Customs. To get feedback on your transmission, click on the line anywhere to highlight it. 
And the first tab you're going to look under is Original Manifest Tracking. Select that. And again, this will show your transmissions out and the number of bills you transmitted. Our system will also assign a reference number for each of your transmissions out. Whenever you transmit an original manifest, your reference number will always begin with the prefix ORM to indicate original manifest. Highlight the line, click on Show Acknowledgement, and below, Customs will respond with your feedback. Customs will issue a batch number for each transmission they respond to. This column will indicate Y to indicate yes, you have customs errors, or N for no customs errors. This column will reflect the number of bills of lading customs is responding to. Total number of amendments that were made on your bills of lading, if any. How many bills of lading customs rejected, if any and how many bills of lading customs accepted. The process date and time would be the date and time that customs responds to your information. And again, our reference number will appear in this field. So you can match up the reference numbers from your transmission out to your response back from customs. So if you transmit two bills out, under a particular reference number, and that reference number back indicates that those two bills are accepted by customs with no errors, then you know your manifest is on file. Should anything be rejected, close this screen and go to the Customs Error screen. This screen will display the bill of lady number that has the error message, this column will indicate an error code that Customs transmits back and a brief description of the meaning of that code. Also, again, our system will assign the reference number for you to cross-reference the transmission you sent out and the acknowledgement back from Customs. The Bill Details screen will display the bills of lading that you transmitted out for the port pair that you've highlighted. For the NBO, it will display your house bill numbers as well as the carrier's master bill numbers. Under bill of lading quantity are the piece counts that were issued when you transmitted your bills to customs. Under disposition code, Customs will transmit back various disposition codes based on the status of your shipments. For the NBO, when the carrier files their master bill in AMS and Customs matches it up with the NBO's house bill, the NBO will see a disposition code of 1Y. For the master carrier, the disposition code would be 69 as bill on file. And from there, various disposition codes could come up, again, based on your statuses. Uh, if you issue any amendments against bills, your disposition codes will change. If any holds are placed or do not load messages, those disposition codes will be displayed. Also, under this column for Bill of Lading Error, these are considered manifest errors. This would be an error that would be caught by our system prior to your transmission to Customs. This column would display if you had Customs errors. This column would also note if you have a disposition code that indicates a hold on your cargo, it would also be flagged under this column with a Y to indicate a hold. And this column would indicate a Y if you have deleted a bill of lading from the manifest. 
when the broker makes entry, their piece count they make entry for will appear under the release quantity column. Also, it will note the date and the time and the type of entry that the broker makes. Your disposition codes that appear here, if you want to know the meanings of those, you can always click on disposition code descriptions. And this will give you a listing of all of the disposition codes that are issued by customs with their meanings. This screen also is only going to show the last disposition code that was sent out by customs. If you want to see a full history of all of the codes and the date and times that they were sent out, highlight the line and you can go to AMS bill entry information. And this screen will give you a history for the bill of lading that you're looking under and give you all the codes and the dates and times those codes were issued by customs. Also, this screen will indicate if customs has a hold against your cargo or USDA or any other government agency. If any of these fields are flagged, you might also see under remarks column a Y to indicate that there are remarks. Highlight the line with the Y and click on AMS remark information and it may give you more details. Um, in other words, if you have a, a hold issued by customs and a Y under remarks, you click on AMS remarks information, it may read as an example that Customs wants to do an intensive exam on the container before it's released. May give you information as to where the container would need to be uh, transferred to in order for that exam to take place. Um, also, a Customs inspector may leave his name and a phone number for you to contact if they have a particular question before they release the hold. Double clicking on the bill number in the bill detail screen will take you back to the bill header screen. So if you need to make any amendments or adjustments to the bill, just come back, make your amendments. Any changes you make, you have to be sure to hit save in order to save the information. Now as this is a demo database, None of the bills of lading in the test environment have the amendment button at the top of the screen. Therefore, I am not able in this presentation to demonstrate how to transmit amendments. Um, however, for the trainer who was looking at this, I'm sure you know in advance how to do changes, adds, or deletes. So that would need to be explained to the customer during the presentation. Um, hopefully, maybe IT can fix it to where one of these bills or some of these bills in the system will have that amendment button at the top of the screen so it can be used during training purposes. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to use a live database to demonstrate it. Uh, also, make sure you go over when you do change information, such as piece count, seal number, weight, anything of that nature, you're going to transmit a change amendment. The amendment code for a change is three, which is clerical. If you're going to do a delete amendment, Let's say a bill of lading has been rolled from a, one vessel that you've already submitted to customs is being rolled to a different vessel. First thing the customer would have to do is click on the amendment button, select action code delete, amendment code 2, and hit submit. And that would remove 
this bill of lading from the vessel voyage that it was previously transmitted to customs and accepted on. Once the delete transmission has gone through, then the customer can come back to the bill header, click on Find, bring up the bill of lading number, select it, and then change the vessel name and voyage number in the schedule. Also, of course, they have to set up the new schedule under Voyage before they can change it in the bill header. Setting up the new voyage can be done at any time. But changing the bill header should not be done until after the delete transmission has gone through. When you change the vessel name, you also have to reselect your load and discharge ports. Go back to the top of the screen, save the information, always remember to save, and because it's on a new vessel voyage, it would be transmitted under AMS Add Original Manifest. The Add Amendment would only be used in the case that you've already transmitted a vessel voyage and the same port paired to customs. Let's say you transmitted two bills of lading already to customs for a particular vessel voyage and port pair. Next day you get a third bill of lading for the same vessel voyage, same port pair. Instead of having to retransmit your entire manifest again through Add Original Manifest to add the third bill, the third bill may be added by clicking on the amendment button and now you're going to send an action code add in order to add the third bill to a manifest that's already on file with customs. This is all for the AMS presentation. Again, when a NVO is transmitting. In order to show the screen for a master carrier, you would have to go out and log in under the SCAT route. Pull up, if you're doing the demonstration in the demo database, enter the demo SCAC. And now you would change the group type from NVO to master and save. Log out of root and log back into the demo database. Now on the bill header screen, it's going to be set up for a master carrier. So now doing the demonstration would be for the master carrier in which again you just tell them enter your regular bill of lading number in the first field and in the house bill of lading SCAC, their SCAC will automatically pull in upon saving the bill header. This is how a master carrier would transmit electronically their regular bill. They can also transmit for an automated NVO or a non-automated NVO. So in the case of a non-automated NVO, the carrier would now transmit his bill of lading number as usual, but this time it's not a regular bill. It's a master bill. Therefore, the NVO bill type would read master. After they transmit their master, then they select house, and now they're going to enter the house bill number for the NVO that they're transmitting the house bill for. And over here, they will enter their SCAT code and their master bill number that they're already transmitted to customs for this particular house bill.
automated NVO would just allow them to transmit a regular bill of lading to customs for an automated NVO. Uh, only differences that are on this screen between NVO and non-NVO. Also for using the status uh, complete, this can be for NVO or non-NVO. It should always stay at complete. Uh, by changing the status to delete and saving the screen would prevent the information on this screen to be transmitted to customs. So let's say you input a bill of lading in the system, but you haven't yet transmitted it. And then you found out the booking was canceled. It's simply not going to go. You don't want that bill to transmit. You can change the status to read delete, save it, and when you transmit your manifest through Add Original Manifest for your other bills of lading on the same vessel voyage, this particular bill would not transmit. It's way different than transmitting a delete amendment, something that all users need to understand. Anything in deleted status will not transmit. For the master carriers who have empty containers that they have to report to customs, they have to change their bill type from way bill to empty. Enter the bill of lading details, same as before, except now they're going to empty all their, they're going to enter all their containers. Since they're empty containers, they won't have seal numbers. And under packages, you're just going to note the container numbers. For pieces, it's going to be one. And for packages, it can read unit. And you're going to enter the tear weight of the container for the weight. And under cargo, again, itemize the lines, pull in the container number, and under description of goods, just note that it's an empty container for repositioning. And that's all that's required by customs. The fact that it's being sent as an empty bill will let customs know that there will not be an entry against this bill of lading. So therefore, you don't have to worry about it being sent to GO. Now, if you want to show a customer how to transmit ISFs along with their AMS, again, we're going to go back to root. And let's go to oh, security manager this time. Under security manager, click find, demo search. Want to make sure that you check the box for add original manifest and save the screen. I'm going to also go back and change it back to NVO. since majority of the customers you're training on this will be NVOs. Log out, go back into the demo database, go to the Security Manager, click Find, enter Demo SCAC, and make sure the Add Original ISF box is checked so that it will show up on the bill header screen. And now when you pull up the bill header screen, you'll have the additional fields that are required for ISF filings. Again, I'm just going to pull up a bill of lading to display.
In addition to filling out the bill for AMS, if the customer is reporting both AMS and ISF, they have to enter the additional um, elements that are required. And again, these are required of the importer of record. So they have to report the seller of goods, the party that consolidates the container, and also the party that stuffs the container. Booking party is not required for the ISF-10. Booking party is only required for ISF-5 filings. ISF-5 would be for um, reporting FROB cargo ISFs and also for ISFs that are on an end bond such as a T&E or IE. So the user can click on seller, select the shipper from the database, same as they, or select the customer from the database, same as they would shipper. Or if seller is same as shipper, all they have to do is check the box next to seller and the information automatically carries over. Works the same for consolidator and stuffer. Also under consolidator, if you have more than one consolidator, you can click on more, click add row, type in the name of the second consolidator, and I'm just going to use the same name since I don't know one offhand. Hit your tab key, and again it pulls it in from the database. You can save it. It won't be displayed on the bill header screen, but it will transmit to customs. And it's the same for stuffer. Again, if you have more than one stuffer. Also for the ISF, in addition to consignee and notify, they also have to report importer, buyer, and ship to parties. Again, they can pull the information in from the customer profile screen or they can check the boxes next to if the importer is the same as the consignee, check the box, buyer's the same, ship to is the same, but your notify may be different. So if notify is different, then again you could have a different name and address there but all of the rest of them would reflect the same party as consignee. In this case, notify is same. All the other information is already here from the AMS filing. So the only other thing they would have to add in addition for the ISF would be the harmonized code. So for the harmonized code, they can either do a search on the code or the commodity description. And again, six digits are the minimum that's required by customs. It's always better if you know the actual Here we go. Always better if you know the actual code because it's easier than trying to search on the commodity. Select it. Information is supposed to pull in and this screen is supposed to go down. But as you see, that's not happening. So that is a fault in the system. Be aware of that. That needs to be fixed before you can do this demonstration to a customer. The screen is not going down and there's no way to X out of it. So that means that I have to go back to the top and I'm going to have to go out of the screen if I can. And I don't know if it's going to let me. So I'm going to have to log back in again. Uh, Whoever is listening to this, 
got to address that with IT since I'm no longer able to do that. Uh, so let's try this again, only this time instead of doing a search for the harmonized code, I am just simply going to type a code in. Check that box. And I'll just make one up too. Okay. Hazard code. Again, only if it's hazardous cargo. Again, you have to do a search by commodity name. Select the right UN number. And behind the scenes, it should transmit class and packing group. Also, for ISF requirements, you have to have the manufacturer's name. And if you have more than one commodity description, let's say you have uh, various commodity descriptions in the same container, but each commodity description has a different harmonized code, you have to have the manufacturer and country of origin based on each individual harmonized code. So because you only have one container, your next row wouldn't be item two because you don't have two items under equipment and packages. Again, it would be item one. So it's the same container, but a different commodity with a different harmonized code. Just keep making it item one. The only time you're going to use item one, two, three, four, etc., is when you have more than one container that you're reporting. So again, for manufacturer, click on the binocular icon, type in the manufacturer's name, do search to select it from the customer profile screen and a drop-down selection for country. Also, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the screen, you'll see under ISF details, transmission type. When you send it as a complete transaction, you're telling customs that everything that I've got on this screen that I'm submitting to you is correct and complete. So customs will not be expecting an amendment on this. If you're only sending uh, certain pieces of information at one time, you are allowed flexible range or flexible timing. There are certain elements such as uh, manufacturer name and address. Maybe you don't have it at the time. You can trans um, transmit it under flexible range and timing and this lets customs know that some of the information that you submitted is going to be updated again later. Under shipment type you have standard or regular filings and then you have other types of filings such as if you have something that's household goods or personal effects. Majority of your commercial shipments are going to be under standard or regular filings. Go back to the top of the screen and hit save. Information has been saved. Again, if any of the details are missing that are required, let me delete manufacturer and let me take out the country of origin. I'm going back to the top of the screen and I'm going to save again. Now it tells me the bill is not valid for ISF transmission. Do you want to save it? Okay. I'll save the data, but it's going to let me know I have an ISF error. Click on it and it tells me the error. Country is not selected for the manufacturer, nor is there a manufacturer. So I have to go back, select it, and the country of origin 
go back and resave. And now the ISF error should go away. Also, if the user has the screen set up for ISF filings, but let's say they only want to file the AMS and they're not filing the ISF. So they leave off all of the details that are required for ISF. When they save the bill, they're going to get that same pop-up screen that we will read, the bill is not valid for ISF transmission. Do you want to save it? You say OK, and it's going to highlight the red ISF error at the top of the screen. But if you're only following AMS, it doesn't matter because it doesn't impact your AMS filing. So the customer needs to understand that. If you're only filing AMS, ignore the ISF error. Once you're ready to transmit the ISF, you have all the details entered. You're going to click on Open ISF Screen. Put a check mark next to the bill of lading you want to transmit and hit Submit Bill. That transmits your ISF. Wait about 20 minutes. Come back later. Again, come to this screen. Highlight it. It will show your transaction going out, the status. If Customs has accepted your ISF, you will get back a transaction number. And this is the number the Customs broker uses when they make entry on the cargo. Our system assigns a reference number, and the status message will either say ISF accepted or ISF rejected. If it's rejected, you can double click on the line and it's going to give you your error message. Below, you also get disposition codes. So for a customer who is only filing ISF but not AMS, they will get disposition codes to let them know if the AMS has been filed or not. Because before this was added, only the users who filed AMS were aware if an IFS was on file. And that's because on the AMS main screen, when they go to select their vessel voyage, okay. or not. In the Build Detail screen under Disposition, they get a disposition code that reads 3Z. The 3Z, and again you can look it up under Disposition Codes, 3Z means that the ISF is on file. ISFs are only filed on the lowest bill of lady number, so they're never filed on master bills. They can be filed on the carrier's regular bill or on the house bills, but never on master bills. But the disposition code 3Z in AMS lets the AMS user know that the ISF is on file. But if the user isn't using AMS, they don't see those disposition codes. And that's why we have the disposition codes on the ISF screen. So they can tell that there is a match between the ISF that they've just filed and the AMS that's on file with Customs. It would all be based on disposition code and again a description of the meaning. And you also can click on the disposition codes on this screen if you're not sure what the code means. Another way to file ISF, you can go to the menu and click Add Original ISF. And instead of filing the ISF per bill of lading, you can file based on vessel voyage and port pair. 
So if I display a particular port pair and I want all the bills that I input for that port pair to pop up, I can just go down and just click and transmit them all at one time. Of course, they have to have an ISF input against them in order to do that. And again, you just hit Submit Bill. Once you've transmitted an ISF and it has been accepted by Customs, when you come back to this screen, when you click on the box under a bill, instead of saying Submit Bill, it's going to now read Replace Bill. So if you make any changes to the ISF, you'll now be sending it as a replacement, not resending the same original ISF again. But that's only if the original ISF was accepted by Customs. Also, uh, if once it's been accepted by Customs, this field that reads Delete Bill, this tab, will become active so that you can also click on it should you have to delete an ISF. So say another party filed it first and you don't need to file it, or again, the shipment was canceled, you can delete the ISF with Customs. So this takes care of AMS and ISF filings. Now back to the bill header screen. Close this down. Back on the bill header screen, let's say you have a user that only files ISFs. And I know that Artemis does have some customers that only file ISFs and not AMS. And for that, there's actually a shortcut that they can take if they're only filing ISF, period. In the Tables menu under Vessel, you can create a dummy vessel because the vessel voyage is not one of the 10 elements that's required for an ISF. The vessel voyage is only required for AMS. So the user can actually create a dummy vessel. It doesn't matter what the Lloyd's code is or anything. Remember, this vessel will not transmit to customs but they also have to create a dummy voyage schedule for this dummy vessel. And again, it doesn't matter about the vessel itself and the ports. You can just issue any load in any discharge port. doesn't matter what the dates of arrival or sale dates are, and they never have to change or be updated because, again, none of this information will transmit for the ISF. It just allows the user to do a shortcut when following their ISFs. So when they go to the bill header screen, they enter their bill of lading number, and they have to enter the elements that are required. So Again, we've got a master bill number. Oops. Okay. Get it in there. All right. So we still have to report all of the shipping and recipient information. And for consignee, come down, and now I'm going to enter my dummy vessel. And again, it doesn't matter what ports I select. None of this information is transmitting to customs. 
but the reason I have to create a void schedule <clears throat> in a dummy vessel is because our system will not allow you to save the bill header without this section of the bill header being entered. So I have to put something there. That's the whole reason of creating the dummy vessel and the dummy void schedule. Containers are not even part of the ISF requirement. So you don't have to report equipment. You don't have to report packages. None of this information is required for ISF. If you're not sure what the 10, uh, 10 elements are, look it up. Piece count, package type, equipment, vessel, ports, none of that are part of the 10 elements required on an ISF. We come down to the cargo item. Again, doesn't matter about the container number. Type in your description of goods. Enter your harmonized code. Got to have your manufacturer. And got to have your country of origin. Go back to the top of the screen and hit save. Now it's telling me the bill's not valid for AMS transmission, but that's okay because I'm not sending AMS. I'm only sending ISF. Okay? It's telling me I have an ISF error. Entity number. I'm not missing anything on this screen, but they're right. I have to have an entity number for my consignee and my importer. So I still want to save the screen, which I have. Take note of my bill number so I can come back and search it. And now I'm going to go to the customer profile screen. Search for my consignee, who is also my importer. And this is the number that's required. Again, for fallen ISF and only for the consignee and the importer, this entity identifier number is required. For companies, you can use any corporation, use their IRS number, which again, the importer is responsible for supplying. And it has to be put in in the correct format. So two digits with a dash mark and then digits behind it. If it's a personal effects shipment, it can be the Social Security or Passport number. So if you select Social Security, you also have to enter besides the Social Security number, which again has to be in the correct format, you also have to select their date of birth. For passport number, in addition to Social Security, date of birth, you also have to issue, uh, indicate the country that issued the passport. In this case, we're going to do IRS number. And save. Do you want the entity identifier? This time, we say yes. If you don't have enough digits in here, it's not going to save it. If it's not in the correct format, it won't save it. Now it's updated OK. So now I can go back to my bill header, search on that bill of lading. And this is something, again, you want to do in advance so that when you do save the bill header screen, you won't see that ISF error. I'm going to take out my consignee and reselect it. So this time it will pull in the correct number on the entity identifier. Now I'm going to save. 
Now it just says it's not valid for AMS, but again, we don't care about that. We're not filing AMS. Okay, I no longer have an ISF error, and I've reported all the 10 elements that are required for an ISF. Everything that's missing here will be reported by the filer who files the AMS. So again, this would only be used if you have a customer that files ISFs only. And they file it the same way. Go to the ISF screen, select the bill number, hit submit. And wait for the information to come back from customs. So that's both AMS and ISF together and ISF alone. Uh, the only other thing, uh, showing vessel arrival, vessel departure. Again, this is for the master carrier. Only master carriers need to do this. And they need to always depart the vessel from the load port. So to do that, just click on you, select from the calendar icon the date the vessel actually left the load port and you have to have a time. In most cases, you're not going to get an actual time. Um, you can dummy the time of departure. Click Done and save it. And that's all that's required for vessel departure. For vessel arrival, same thing. Pull up your vessel voyage and now it's going to be at the discharge port. Again, click New and select the date and time the vessel arrives at the discharge port. And save. And there you go. Uh, vessel arrival should be done within 24 hours of actual arrival. Failing to arrive a vessel could uh, keep your customs release from coming into ACE so that no one will see the customs release. If you want to see a hard copy of the actual manifest that you filed, uh, you can go to Customs Manifest Report. Again, select your vessel voyage, load, discharge port, click on print customs manifest, and it will just display a hard copy. Uh, for our bulk carriers, whenever we transmit uh, their cargo information, we have to email a copy of the manifest to the carrier and also their agent at the discharge port. Also, um, on here we have a hold report, which if a client wants to see if they have any holds on bills, they can select a date range. Just select the date they want to check from, so from December 7th to the current date, hit submit, and if there are any bills of lading that have a hold against them, it will display on this screen. Now seeing as this is a dummy database, nothing is going to come up here. But in a live environment, it would display actual bills of lading if that customer does have any bills on hold. But it just gives them an easy way to see on a date range and gives them the various vessel voyages and their bill numbers and what type of hold they have. And if they need to, they can print the report. They can also double click on a line to open a bill of lading up if there's something with the bill itself that they want to look at. Only other thing here would be IT selection. Uh, currently, the only we only have uh, one client 
uh, Moffret that is using this, but you may have some customers that would be interested in it and need to be able to transmit electronically. Uh, ITs, again, T and E's or IEs. So select the ports. You want to click New. It opens up a screen. And anyone who is set up to electronically report uh, this information and bond information is assigned a V number by Customs. So this is for IT, or you can select T and E or IE. You have to type in the quantity. This is how many pieces are in the container that you're reporting. IRS number. Shipment value. And the customs inland destination. Click on bill cross reference. Highlight the bill. This says Chicago, so actually this should be Chicago too. There we go. Just put a check mark in there and you hit save. Information has been saved. And your IT is displayed on the screen. Um, Highlight it, and once the IT um, has reached its destination, you can arrive the IT by IT number, or you can arrive it by container number, or by bill of lading number. And also you can get an acknowledgement on your IT arrival. So in this screen, again, you're just going to note input the arrival time. Just note it in here, you've got the date when it's due to, a, to arrive at the terminal or, or at the railhead, wherever it's going to. And you can select a time on it if you have an idea of the time that it's going to arrive. Again, save the information. You can show arrival history. Again, get your acknowledgement from customs that your IT arrival was accepted. And you can also look at a hard copy of the IT itself. So if you want to actually print a copy of it, it shows you what the IT itself would look like. Uh, if you're doing, let's say, a T&E, the only difference is for a T&E, you have to also enter your customs foreign destination and harmonized code is required. And same thing for an IE. Otherwise, it's done the same way as the IT. Now, going back to the bill header, The only other thing that needs to be demonstrated is transmitting FROB cargo. Master carriers have to report FROB cargo. And this is foreign cargo remaining on board, coming from a foreign port, going to another foreign port. But the vessel makes a stop in the U.S. first. So the bill is reported same as before. Only on your vessel voyage, you're going to have your load ports going to be foreign and your discharge port is going to be foreign. Everything else is the same as any other bill. It's just that you're going to have two foreign ports listed in your schedule. When transmitting it for AMS, you have to transmit it first over the U.S. port that it's calling. So pull up the vessel voyage. 
So let's say the vessel is calling Long, uh, Long Beach, but the cargo on board is not discharged in Long Beach. It's going to discharge in Lima, Peru. But in order to transmit it, I have to transmit it over the port of Long Beach to Customs. So under Add Original Manifest, my first report is going to be from Hong Kong to the port in the U.S. that the vessel's calling. And then immediately after that, let's pretend that Oakland here actually reads Lima, Peru. So now I'm going to transmit my Lima, Peru. So again, I just put a check in the box under Original Manifest and hit Save. When I go to the AMS main screen and pull it up, it's also going to display Hong Kong, Long Beach, and Hong Kong, Lima. And when I click on Long Beach, it may note the number of bills that were transmitted, but to see the actual bills of lading that are considered FROB, I would have to click on the foreign to foreign port pair, and then that would display my bill numbers under the foreign to foreign port pair. That's how you transmit FROB. And when you're doing ISFs for FROB, that's when you have to report the booking party. Who booked the cargo? Now, there are only five elements that are required for the ISF when reporting FROB cargo. Check for the five elements that are required. Booking party is one. And again, you're going to have a foreign to foreign port because it's going to be for fraud cargo or it could also be cargo going on a T&E. So it's still, let's say it's coming off in New York, but its destination is in Montreal, Canada. So it's moving on a T&E from the Port of New York to Montreal. Uh, New York would be your discharge port, but your place of delivery, Montreal. But it's moving in bond on a T&E. So the goods aren't actually being cleared in New York. So in that case, again, you report just the five elements. Um, And that's all that I can think of that needs to be gone over. If you can think of anything else you have any questions on, um, let me know. And this presentation is ended.